So welcome everyone to Quantum Science Seminar number 57. Today we have Mete Atatüre uh, talking about nuclear spins in a semiconductor quantum dot through the looking glass and what we found there. Um, let me quickly uh, introduce Mete. Mete Atatüre completed his PhD at uh, Boston, Un Boston University uh, in uh, the Quantum Imaging Laboratory on Multiparameter Entanglement and then joined Atach Emamoglu's group at ETH Zurich uh, as a postdoctoral fellow on quantum photonics. Since 2007, he has been a faculty at the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge, um, and his current research efforts include optical control of spin photon interfaces in solids, development of nanoscale quantum sensors, and investigations of novel quantum materials and devices. And I'm sure we will hear uh, uh, the newest state of the art uh, about this today. Um, he is a fellow of the Institute of Physics, the Optical Society of America, and the Turkish uh, Science Academy. Um, with this, I would hand over to you, Mette, to uh, uh, present uh, your newest results. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, uh, I will go ahead and share my presentation. Give me one second. I'll do that. And then... If I do this, this is okay, yeah? You're able to see the presentation, perfect. Okay, so um, thank you very much for this invitation. Um, uh, I think we all had many online calls and, and meetings, <laughs> maybe too much, but, uh, but I, I really appreciate the idea of a quantum science seminar series like this. I'm very happy to be part of it. Um, so, uh, so hopefully uh, I, I get to present uh, some of the exciting work that we've been uh, realizing, uh, building up on existing work uh, or previous work on or using semiconductor quantum dots. And I chose the title as, uh, well, the subtitle is Through the Looking Glass and what we found there. Of course, that's a reference to um, Alice in Wonderland series, uh, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing because the, in this particular uh, image from, uh, from the, the, um, the original uh, book work, um, Alice actually goes through the looking glass or the mirror and everything is a lot more exciting and interesting than you anticipated when you make it to the other side. And you can see in here, uh, you know, the, the clock all of a sudden has a character uh, and, and the flower pot also has a, immediately a face, a character, so things are interacting. So the, the reason why I said this is because that's exactly what we've been doing with, uh, in general, not just self-assembled quantum dust, which I'll talk about today uh, primarily, but in general, this, this language of artificial atom, probably you've, you've all heard of it, it's, it stems from the same concept. Regardless of which physical system you're dealing with, we want to take that physical system because we think, you know, in, in the community, we think that a particular system might have an advantage over another one, and we're like, we'd like to study it. But then we immediately go into the cycle of let's make an artificial atom. And what does that mean? Of course, atoms themselves are complicated as well, but you, you know, we, we simplify the model down to a two level system and you know, light comes out, for example. Um, so we try to do the same thing with, with solid state systems. And that's why the, the phrase artificial atom came about over the years as how can we take away everything that makes the system different than an atom so that all that's left is just two levels and photons that come out because of these two levels, because of the transitions. So that has been the spirit of the field for a long time. How do you make a particular fundamentally complicated system, be it semiconductor or, or other physical systems. I can show you a, a, a plethora of physical systems and by no means this is a, an exhaustive list, but it's a list that I find exciting. Um, in all of these systems, many things re related to quantum science and its applications have been realized. But in almost all efforts, the, the idea is to simplify it as much as possible so that you, you get rid of all the properties that the material itself brings you at the end of the day. And you're left with a, a two level system uh, plus, uh, plus an optical transition that, that comes with it. Um, I'll, I'll highlight in this talk, I'll highlight what we've been doing with quantum dots, these semiconductor uh, nanostructures and how we work with them. Uh, and you'll see that in, in, in the effort to make them as two level system as possible, we, we almost went through the looking glass. Uh, and, and came out on the other side. And then we realized that it's a, actually a, a rather complicated 
complex, but also interesting physical systems to study. So, uh, so let's start with that. Um, the reason for all this artificial atom uh, language and to add a bit more to the complexity to, to the, the, or, or content to what we're talking about, it's actually not so much a two-level system that we're interested in. The broader uh, topic on, that's common to all of those physical systems I presented is actually the concept of a quantum node, a, a spin photon interface, a stationary qubit interacting with a flying qubit in a, in a local uh, 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 situation, uh, let's say, that, that could be used to realize a quantum node. And I called it barley, hops, and water to put it together to get something exciting out of it. And these are the three ingredients. You need to have a good stationary qubit to work with. You need to have a flying qubit that you can entangle with your stationary qubit. That's how you create correlations and extend correlations over long distances and ideally extend your quantum correlations over multiple stationary qubits through exchange of photons uh, or, or flying qubits. And then the third part, of course, is the, the channel itself. Uh, slightly overlooked in some cases, but it's, it's a, a field, research field on its own uh, that focuses on how to get the best communication uh, and, and links uh, between or interconnects between two different uh, stationary qubits or two different nodes that, that put it all together. Obviously, the idea is to, to push towards quantum networks, and everyone uh, in this community is in this particular, with this particular uh, effort, is trying to realize simplified but well behaving uh, physical systems, ingredients to put it all together uh, to realize a basic uh, quantum node operation, uh, essentially. There's, uh, if you look at the history, like to say the last, uh, 20 years or so in this uh, in this field, people will be focusing, researchers will be focusing on one aspect particularly, because there's a lot of work to be done for the for the stationary qubit to have it really good quality. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to keep the photons as clean and and uh, close to transform limit or pure as uh, as possible. Uh, and of course, the communication channel aspect of it is especially if you include nanofabrication, waveguide formations, nanostructures, that's, that's a whole research field on its own anyways. So we're now luckily in this era where actually all of them are really coming together and we're, a we're able to see first signs of, uh, you know, well-behaved, uh, desirable quantum nodes using solid state systems. And we already have very good example from one of the ones that I've listed before, Diamond, for example, color centers in Diamond, uh, the, the, the three node quantum network uh, from Delft is actually relying on diamond color centers and it's fantastic work uh, among other uh, color centers as well. So that's the, uh, you know, I'll, I'll add here one more thing that, that you, you can't just have one stationary qubit in, in one node, you want to have a few. Uh, it turns out that this is, this is quite attractive to do anything sensible, anything uh, useful. So uh, remember that there's a, the concept of a local memory uh, nearby, in addition to a broker qubit or your electron spin, perhaps, interacting with photons is highly desirable. So of all the physical systems um, that are being considered and investigated, the semiconductor quantum dots are, you know, they've been around for quite a while, but the, the break point actually goes back to 2004 with this uh, very nice paper from, uh, uh, from uh, Munich, from Halit Karai and Richard Wurtburn in collaboration, um, where they actually, uh, they've taken these quantum dots and put them into a gated structure. So what, what does that mean? So first of all, the quantum dot is, is a collection of atoms inside semiconductor atoms buried inside other semiconductors. The difference is, the uh, energy band gap of these two semiconductor species is very different. That creates a material based confinement for electrons, holes, and therefore their uh, bind, uh, bound states, uh, the excitons. So uh, in the process of trying to grow, uh, as, as you're seeing here, in the process of trying to grow, say, gallium arsenide, if you interrupt the growth, atom by atom, layer by layer growth, and introduce indium into the uh, chamber, the growth chamber by molecular beam epitaxy, you start trying to build a very strained, due to lattice mismatch, a very strained layer of indium gallium arsenide or, or indium arsenide. That doesn't last very long after about between one to two monolayers of this species, of this, of this material, they actually go through a phase transition and clump up, just like uh, water on, on um, wax paper, yeah? So you get these little, little bubbles, droplets all over the place. And then at that point, if you keep growing, then you're going to, have some dislocations to relax the strain, but you'll be able to grow your material of indium arsenide. If you don't continue your growth and stop, then, and then continue growing gallium arsenide as you did before, then you're going to have these little islands of different materials, indium arsenide materials trapped in this matrix of gallium arsenide. And that's what you're seeing here. These little humps, these little bubbles are actually these 
uh, indium arsenide uh, uh, quantum dots, and they're localized in this uh, in this, uh, this self-assembled uh, arrangement. And then what happened in 2004, this has been going on for a while, but in 2004, the, the key was being able to electrically control these quantum dots. So what does that mean? You have a contact at the top, a contact at the bottom, it's basically capacitor plates, so you can apply electric field. But more importantly, from one of the contacts in the back, the N-doped Galmar's not there, you can actually introduce charges into your quantum dot. All right. So by simply changing the voltage, your conduction then for your quantum dot is either empty or it has an excess electron ready present uh, for the problem that you're trying to solve. And then when you bring optics, then you can talk about a charged quantum dot. And here what you're seeing is as a function of gate voltage, the charging state changes just like the Coulomb diamonds in electrically defined quantum dots, you're loading your quantum dot with one electron at a time, all right? So the Coulomb blockade prevents more than one electron to hop in unless you bring, bring the, the extra uh, energy required to hold them together in the same location. Uh, but you basically you're seeing a neutral exciton, it's just an electron and hole, an empty quantum dot, one electron charge, two electron charge, three electron charge quantum dot, discrete states. Now, this is great because if, you know, there, there's a lot that, that has been done with uh, second, you know, set, doubly charged or triply charged quantum dots. But what is unique about this one, X1 minus, and what you're seeing here is under an applied magnetic field, you see the splitting, the Zeeman splitting, is that you now have a, you don't have two levels where there's optical transitions, you have two levels in the ground state corresponding to the spin orientation of that electron that you trapped. And the excited state is an additional exciton, all right? So basically you have, all of a sudden, you have a four level system in a in highly simplified manner, a four level system to work with where the ground state is defined by spin orientation. The excited state is defined by the, uh, the, the type of exciton that you're able to drive or you're able to contain in this uh, in the system. And of course, both ground and excited states react to uh, Zeeman, uh, uh, the applied magnetic field by Zeeman energy and, uh, and it gives you these transitions. Now this would be slightly boring, uh, uh, if it was exactly like this, uh, there are cross terms, which makes makes it a lot more exciting uh, in terms of realizing realizing a lambda scheme uh, as well. So it gives us this this building block for all our experiments where we have a charge control. We know deterministically what our stationary qubit is. That's the electron and with its spin projections, and the optics link to a flying qubit is exactly these transitions that you're seeing. And by creating by, by driving these transitions carefully. We, uh, we are able to create an electron pho photon uh, or spin photon entanglement uh, directly from this, uh, from this picture, all right? So that's our spin photon quantum interface they would like to work with. Great, this is what it looks like in our experiments. This is our gallium arsenide chip. These are electrical connections that we make so that we can control the charging state. Uh, and then this is a, uh, it's a solar immersion lens. It's basically a big lens glued directly on top of the uh, chip. And if you look with a microscope through the lens, through the looking glass almost, uh, you can see the contact. Uh, these, these are just titanium window over here, a very thin window. And if you look, zoom in further, then you start seeing the quantum dots. And we sit on one, and this is the way we do, okay? So this is down now, reducing all the way down to the single quantum dot. And, uh, and everything that I'll present is based on saying, uh, sitting exactly like this on, on one of these guys and using the optical transitions. All right. So, Here's a, again, a very short list. I don't want to make a very exhaustive list, but here's the list of many things that people have done over the years using the quality of the photons that come from a quantum. I would say the, to highlight this, almost like a sales hat on, uh, with a sales hat on, I would say the, the photons from a quantum are actually, at the moment, currently state of the art to a certain extent. What you're seeing here is, uh, you know, people have done very nice multiple proposal sampling, generating cluster states, uh, being able to link it to other uh, other species, other uh, types of systems, including trapped ions. So the photonic part is fantastic. So that's that's great motivation. And here is another uh, chart that actually uh, amplifies it. Uh, Meta, Meta, Meta. Can I can I jump in? Um, we have some sound problems uh, from your side. The sound looks, uh, the sound sounds very distorted. Um, can you can you hear me now? No, it's still is distorted. That's very strange. Okay. It was okay at the beginning and appeared only, uh, yeah, since last, I don't know, one minute. Oh, okay. 
Is, is it still like that? Is it still bad? Yeah, it's still a bit distorted. Mm, I don't know what to do. The... Maybe it's the connection, but... Perhaps. Um, actually, now it's better. Looks now, now, now it's better, actually. Is it better? Yeah, it's 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 <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, we okay. Good. I think we just go on. All right, but let me know. Yeah. Yes, but but do let me know if uh, if it goes bad. I'll I'll repeat yeah. again. Yeah. Maybe it's the connection. Um, so let me see here. So what I want to basically what I'm trying to say is the photons from a quantum dot. If you haven't heard it before, they are amazing. Okay, and I'll give you two examples. One is this brightness versus mode quality. How how clean the photon is the wave function uh, the, the wave packet of the photon is uh, comparing multiple systems this is spdc parametric down conversion beautiful photons suffering from uh, a bit of brightness uh, at the single photon level uh, and quantum dots have actually uh, you know quite significant uh, brightness and uh, quality of the photons at the same time and i will highlight uh, in particular one work uh, this is from richard warburton's group uh, the open cavity approach to a quantum dot where you take the same device that I've just told you uh, and put a DBR below and above it, uh, basically two mirrors below and above it and, and, and tune it, uh, they were able to get fantastic cooperativity from a single quantum dot. And, and the quality of the photons at the end from, from generation all the way to the detector, useful uh, practical collection rate of, of uh, something beyond 50%. So it's, it's unmatched at the moment. Uh, it's fantastic results. So, with that, that kind of uh, says, okay, well, if they're so good, what is the problem? What is that what, what, from the spin photon interface? It turns out we also need, obviously for spin photon interface, we need spin coherence, the stationary qubit to be operating and behaving well. So what we do is we, then we should check for the spin coherence for the, uh, for the electron. And when we do that, and we do this by, again, something we borrow from uh, more from quantum optics and atomic physics, instead of directly coupling by uh, a magnetic transition, spin up to spin down, we actually use optics to real realizing this lambda uh, scheme. And we get something on the order of the, the, the free induction decay for electron typical in a quantum dot is on the order of one to two nanoseconds. So this is terrible, right? So I had my sales hat on for the photons, but I can't really have any sales hat on for one to two nanoseconds. This is terrible, actually. So, so something obviously is up. So the first thing you check in, in spin physics, of course, in these kind of systems is to see if what's causing dephasing is inherent and pure, or if it is external and is slowly varying, it can be decoupled, right? So when we do this, we have to do something, uh, we have to do spin echo or Han echo type uh, uh, measurement. When we do this, it turns out that the spin coherence extends to 10 microseconds. So four to five, five to 10 microseconds, which is, you know, it's, it's orders of magnitude longer. So it tells you immediately that there is a slowly evolving noise in the background that's problematic to us, right? So now this is where the material property comes in. The material property is that we're talking about 50,000 nuclear spins that the electron sees. There's the wave function of the electron is as big as the quantum dot, more or less. The quantum dot itself is about 20 nanometers. And the wave function of the electron extends over every lattice site. But at every lattice site, you have a nuclear spin, which has a non-zero spin. Every nucleus has a non-zero spin in indium gallium arsenide. So basically, you have a terrible ensemble that you're talking to. 50,000 independent nuclear spins are talking to the electron and not even dipolar, it's contact interaction. You're actually on site, right? The electron wave function is, is present on site at each lattice site. So what it means is that your, if I look at this part as spin down and spin up uh, transitions for the electron, they're actually getting, what determines the coherence is how much they fluctuate over time. And they're being broadened by variations in the nuclear spin polarization, even if you don't want to polarize it, because nuclear spin fluctuates over time, you can talk about an, a mean IZ that actually fluctuates and acts as an effective magnetic field that the electron experiences. You think you apply two Tesla externally, the electron sees a two Tesla plus nuclear, nuclear field fluctuations. And it scales, if you consider the fluctuations, as effectively root 10. So you're going to see significant fluctuations that broaden these transitions. That is the culprit 
for why the electron spin in a quantum dot is crap. It's actually, uh, you know, in stark contrast to the photon side of it, right? So, however, the construction of the system, if it weren't for this classical, almost classical, slowly varying noise background, if you could access that nuclear ensemble, it is not much different than having a, an, an atomic system, an atomic ensemble inside a cavity. There is a mode that everyone talks to, more than they talk to each other individually. So the mode creates, mediates interactions between space independently between different species. That makes a very exciting system. With a quantum dot, you have 50,000 nuclear spins. They don't like to talk to each other because these are nuclear spins. It's a very slow interaction. But in the presence of an, of an omnipotent electron that sits over the whole quantum dot, over all of these nuclei, random nuclei at different locations, independent of where they're positioned, can interact with each other via the electron. So this creates, again, this, the, the platform for an exciting system. But it's just that it's how do we access it? You know, in this, in this cavity system, you know, you can em envision accessing individual atoms that makes it very accessible and, 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 and nice to control. In this system, we're talking about, you know, lattice sites in an atom, or in, 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 a, in a crystal. Uh, so how do we access these, uh, these nuclear spins? That's why it has always been a nuisance, a background problem that makes the electron spin that you're interested in suffer. But if we look at it closely, of course, this is not just a simple background field fluctuations. It does have hyperfine interaction. It does have spin flips to the point where you can actually polarize nuclear spin. This is called dynamic nuclear spin polarization. It has been realized over many years. There's a very, very nice review paper that I'm highlighting here. Uh, and I would encourage anyone interested in this field to, uh, to look into it. But basically, through, through your electron, you can go through electron nuclear spin flips and through the, through the optics, you can control the degree of nuclear spin flips. You can almost tailor a particular mean field, IZ, a uh, you know, mean field projection of your nuclear spin ensemble uh, by using the electron and its optical transitions, right? So, and people have done up to 70% polarization of the ensemble. That's amazing because that corresponds to many Tesla of effective magnetic field coming from the nuclei seen by the electron, all because of this contact interaction that uh, that we have yeah so the overhauser field can reach many teslas effectively by simply optically polarizing the nuclei now the, while this is exciting at the same time it's also not very useful if you want to reduce the noise of the nuclear ensemble right? because 70 percent polarized versus zero percent polarized are not that far off from how how much fluctuation they cause the nuclear, the electron spin. So you don't win by much unless you get to 90% or so, 99%. And, we, and we're unable to do that. So we're unable to get 50,000 nuclear spins and all polarize them in one direction. So, but we want to do that. We want to make our electron spin much better and we want to reduce the noise due to nuclear spins. In addition to the trivial polarization, uh, there's an option B. The main thing we actually want to do isn't so much polarization, it is to reduce fluctuations, right? That's what we want. But if you have N independent nuclear spins, you will have root N fluctuations. So we need to create a state effectively that has some arbitrary mean polarization, IZ, whatever it might be, whatever is necessary, but with a fluctuation much less than root N. We need to cool the nuclear spins. That's what we need to do. Our base temperature is 4K, in all these experiments, liquid helium temperature. But 4K is nothing compared to nuclear spin uh, splittings. It's practically infinite temperature. So nuclear spins don't care the fact that we try to cool our electron spin. So we need to go beyond the, the ambient cooling. So basically uh, what, we, what we need to do is look into how we can cool the nuclear spin ensemble to a temperature much below the 4K so that we can actually see reduction of fluctuations. That's how it started. So for me, this is a, this is a nice place to, to ask if you have any questions before I move on, because we're right at the cusp of going in through the, the, the looking glass. Until now, it's been about the electron and the photon, but now we're going into what we can do with the nuclear spins. Yeah. Yes, indeed, Mete. Thank you very much. There are actually some questions. Okay. So maybe the first one, uh, you motivated um, in the context of, of quantum communication to, to couple quantum dots that are very far apart. But what about interactions between quantum dots? Is there a way to bring them together and make them interact directly? 
absolutely. So um, within within limited, uh, uh, let's say, um, maneuver space, uh, you, what you, what's advantageous with these kind of quantum dots, at least, is that when you grow the first layer, first the one layer of quantum dots, it is random. You don't actually dictate where the quantum dots are going to be. There's a lot of people working on how to make them deterministic in local in specific areas, and that's developing quite well, but it's, we're not there yet necessarily. Um, so the first layer is spontaneously formed, but the second layer is nucleated at the side of the quantum dots. So if you actually do cascade uh, quantum dot growth, you can actually have one, two, three, four, couple quantum dots. Then you can talk about either strongly coupled versions, and then you talk about single triplet states and your more higher order states, or you can talk about individual quantum dots all having their own separate optical transitions, but tunable to couple with each other, but also tunable to turn off. So, so the possibility is there, but but limited to a few, a uh, few being small now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. And uh, from a broader per perspective, one always says that as opposed to atoms, artificial atoms cannot be made identical. Uh, is this still a problem for current and future applications, especially for quantum dots? The, the answer is, is exactly. That's the reason I think why even our community took on the word artificial atom, because they didn't even think that it could be like atoms. But at this point, I think... Uh, Peter Lodal had a very nice description. These are more like super atoms because they are brighter. They, you know, they can integrate better in waveguides, and we can make them identical, basically by using that that device that I showed. Because in addition to loading electrons, you can actually get DC start shifts of transitions, so you can actually tune many of them overlapping. So one of the experiments we have done in the past was entangling two distant spins. This requires that the optical transitions of these spins of these quantum dots mm -hmm. and Zeeman splittings are identical. So we were able to tune all of those to match one to one, uh, and it takes a few hours to find the right dot, especially <laughs> find the pairs in different crystals. Good. And another question, uh, also in, in this very nice explanation and in analogy with the cavity QED of many many atoms. So uh, in, in in that scenario, the source of noise for the atoms is the motion. So what is the microscopic source of noise for 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 nuclear spins? Huh, interesting. Okay, I like this question. I mean, because it is, uh, it's ultimately stuck in a lattice. You can treat them, uh, in and in, in comparison to the size of the of the electron wave function, you can uh, you can treat them as frozen. So, so actual physical mechanical motion of the nuclear spins is not an issue, but the mechanical vibrations of the lattice, not the individual atom, but the the overall lattice, which has you know phonons. That is a problem because phonons do couple to the electron through the lattice, so and, and in, uh, mostly in the excited state. So when you actually do optical excitations, you get a bit of phonon coupling. So that's the form of uh, you know uh, a, a cap on fidelity you can achieve uh, in terms of uh, photon quality or um, yield, number of photons you can generate per second. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. I would suggest to keep on. Okay. Fantastic. So. Basically, we know that we want to improve our electron spin. The best way to, the, the metric for that is electron spin coherence, say Ramsey, uh, because we can dynamically decouple, but what we ultimately want is our T2 star for electron spin to be long. The reason for this is uh, in, in a spin photon interface, this is something I need to highlight, in a spin photon interface, you're generating a photon. In the process of generating a photon, you don't do dynamic decoupling. You are stuck with T2 star you have. So until a photon actually comes out, you can't do anything. You have to sit and wait. That's the time nuclear spins are fluctuating and destroying your electron spin coherence and therefore puts a cap on maximum spin photon entanglement you can achieve. So that's why, despite being able to extend spin coherence orders of magnitude afterwards to protect the electron spin, we still need to improve our T2 star from a few nanoseconds comparable to photon size, which is a nanosecond. And that's the problem, right? So we want we want 10 nanoseconds or 100 nanoseconds. Then we're, we're so much uh, happier. And of course, you know, then we have to address nuclear spins. So with that motivation, now we're through the, the you know, the, the looking glass. And what we're, what I'm saying here is, instead of treating this, that these are the energy levels on the left, the ground state, as we discussed before, the excited state, and these are the optical transitions that we typically use. We The blue is far detuned Raman transition. This is our coherent control of the electron spin, if you will. The, uh, the, the resonant one 
is readout, which also is one that cycles the system and initializes the system back to a particular spin state. Now, instead of just treating this as a classical, quasi-static uh, quasi classical fluctuations of these otherwise two single states, spin down and spin out for the electron, we should look at the composite. The spin down manifold, this guy over here, is actually many, many layers, very closely packed uh, states corresponding to plus one nuclear spin flip, plus two, plus three, plus four, right? Whatever the IZ is. And IZ can go anywhere from minus 50,000 spins to plus 50,000 spins on the other side. But wherever you park your IZ, the mean, you're going to have a closely spaced energy levels above and below. So when we try to do this extension, uh, the, this uh, far detuned Raman transition, we're not limited by the excited state line width because we're far from it. We're actually limited by how well we can determine this, this resonance, the two photon resonance. So if I translate that into this, this state, essentially your optical fields are trying to couple this state, for example, to that state, IZ plus one, IZ plus one, this state to that state. That's what you're trying to do. Right? An optical transition takes you back down to that particular state under normal circumstances. So if I take that and then rotate it 90 degrees, so that IZ is along Z -ax, uh, uh, X axis, which is more common to, to atomic physics, then we're talking about something like this. We're simultaneously driving all of those possibilities. Now, it turns out there is unharmonicity in the system. This is the key part, because this is what the electron sees in the presence of uh, nuclear spins, whether nuclear spins are up or down compared to the electron being up or down, you get a bit of an unharmonicity and you, you end up with this scenario. So basically, for a given IZ, you will be resonant with the IZ transition. You'll be slightly detuned for the other two uh, components that are, that are nearby. Now, these are very small changes, but nevertheless, to, to emphasize the, the concept. Now, uh, A here is hyperfine coupling, so it gives you an idea of, of the level of shifts that we're talking about. Now, because it is not pure di dipolar, what we actually have is a quadrupolar coupled system. So I won't go into details of it. The main message you need to take home as a, as a more introduction to the, to the concept is that while this is allowed as a two photon transition, this is also allowed, albeit detuned. So we can actually polarize nuclear spin while flipping the electron spin as well. That is the dynamic nuclear spin polarization we're able to achieve. It comes from this kind of terms, right? So we can actually do this transition and, and actually move left or right uh, on the axis. The opposite is also allowed. Our IZ, remember, has a root N distribution. So we don't actually sit in a single IZ where we, our, our nuclear spins are distributed by root N. So technically everything in the, uh, in the lower state is, is occupied. So while this, our optical transition, that is electron spin resonance right here, is also creating additional nuclear spin excitations plus one, it is also creating minus one. If you look at the reverse, that's also possible. But simply from the detunings, it turns out that wherever you park, this is the, the magic part of it, wherever your laser is parked to an IZ, the ensemble gets an overall push inwards. They're trying to go out. They're also trying to go in. Going in is stronger because of detuning mismatches. So in the end, you take your ensemble and you almost shepherd them into a, a narrower distribution. You, you, you sweep towards where your resonance is. But the resonance, the IZ value, is determined by your two photon detuning. This is something you tune in the lab. You set two lasers. If I go back here, just to highlight this, you take two lasers you, or, or one laser and you split them with, uh, uh, with modulators, and then you set this detuning. So in the lab, you can actually choose where the stable point is going to be. This feedback mechanism creates a stable point, lock point, where everything tries to tend to, right? And that's the essence of plan B, option B, not, not focusing on polarizing, but focusing on narrowing the distribution through directional or bidirectional polarizing, all right? So ideally what it means is that now I'm, I can speed up, this, uh, this broadened fuzzy uh, energy levels for the electron down and electron up now goes into a narrower distribution of up and down. That's what you would expect from cooling. And we do this, if we tune, if we, do, if we probe the electron spin resonance, we realize that indeed, for a near thermal distribution, it's it's very broad. Uh, it's about 100 megahertz broad, this, these, these guys. So we're tuning this arrow over here. 
But when we go through this cooling cycle, we park the laser in a steady state. We wait for a while for distribution to narrow down. It actually is much narrower. So that's ex exactly what we wanted. We want the, the fluctuations to be small so that the effect to electron decoherence is limited. And it turns out that, if, of course, I'm not going to claim a temperature because I don't know what temperature means in this in this scenario. But if you were to quote a temperature, then it would correspond to something like 400 micro Kelvin as opposed to 4 Kelvin. Now, that significant reduction of noise compared to being able to polarize, say, 70% or 60% or 80%. So that's where the wind is supposed to be. So let's check. We do a Ramsey free induction decay top measurement. And before we got something between one and two nanoseconds, as you see here. And then if we include this preparation part into the story, so we cool the nuclear spins first and then check uh, what the spin coherence is, all of a sudden it's order of magnitude longer, right? So it tells you that you are able to cool the nuclear spin substantially so that the electron spin free induction decay, the T2 star is prolonged now 40 times longer than the time it takes to generate a photon. So that's where the wind is going to come for spin photon entanglement. That's the main reason why you want to do this. So technically, you could stop here and say, 40 nanoseconds, you're done. You solve the problem of spin photon entanglement cap due to electron dephasing in the process of photon generation and, and not worry about nuclear spins at all. But it turns out, this is a very interesting system we generated. I don't even know what to call it, right? IZ is completely arbitrary. It could even be zero with the reduced fluctuations. So there are many candidates that uh, you could be having uh, for this kind of a system, including squeeze states, as we uh, know a lot from, from the atomic systems, uh, as example. Uh, it could be many body correlations that have lower uh, 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 reduced uh, uh, fluctuations. The nuclear spins might go into a state that is not, ex not seen by the electron, like a dark state. There are many options there. None of them match with the picture we start out with, the classical Newsom's uh, slowly varying noise, right? That's, so that, that's the reason why we said, okay, well, let's, let's actually understand this nuclear system a bit more. So basically this is what, we were, uh, what we've seen before, but if this is true, we go back to our, our picture of this uh, you know, distribution along, along IZ. This is all the transitions that we have available and we chose to cool the system around an IZ value but if you look at the splitting, this is on the order of 25, in some cases, you know, uh, 30 megahertz. So the difference between this transition, the pure ESR transition that does not involve nuclear spins, and this transition that actually flips electron and one nuclear spin together through quadrupolar coupling is about 25 megahertz difference. But look at what we have achieved. This is already around 15 megahertz. So we should be seeing that transition as a sideband almost to the normal electron transition, electron ESR. Very similar to the, you know, we effectively we're doing something like Doppler cooling for the atoms. So we should be seeing some discrete uh, uh, steps over here corresponding to these transitions. Now you could argue, well, th those are obviously second order, so they're not going to be strong. It turns out because of quadrupolar uh, uh, nature of the coupling, they're actually enhanced by first order. So they are, they are supposed to be there as much as the others. So when you do this now, when you take this and drive coherently along the zero resonance, that's your ESR line, you see Rago oscillations, for example, but along the others, if you drive them strong enough, you do beat uh, you know, the, 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 the relatively reduced uh, amplitude and you're able to build up these, these uh, modes popping up. So this, would, this is the electron spin doing its thing without touching nuclear spins. This is first discrete mode that corresponds to one nuclear spin flip. This is two nuclear spins flip and vice versa. So if you do a line cut somewhere further down the line, the spectrum you're getting on a cooled ensemble looks like this. Now this is very interesting because there are two things to highlight here. I'll take a moment to, to highlight these. There are two things to highlight. One, you, there, there are only five peaks. You don't really see anything else. So you don't see like a whole sea of these peaks. If you keep having these, these transitions, why don't you see more? Again, it goes back to quarter polar coupling. The first order and the second order or, the, uh, or plus minus one and plus minus two are all allowed within the quarter polar cu coupling and the rest are second order. So they, they are extremely weak. So these are our truncated space of collective modes of the system. The second thing I wanna highlight is exactly what I just said. 
collective mode. Because this is one nuclear spin flip, but which nuclear spin? We're not talking about a random nuclear spin in the whole ensemble. Like think of the, like uh, uh, you know, people filling the stadiums, right? Hopefully one day we'll have that again. So people filling the stadiums, this is, this is not one people raising their hand. This is a, a wave that people have decided to do. So it's a one collective mode. And that's the reason why it's also enhanced. It is strong. Uh, rather than a tiny little signal, because it is actually enhanced by root 10. The numbers kind of match, so it does suggest that we have a collective response of the nuclear spins, which is very exciting because it talks about coherence immediately. The nuclear, the indistinguishability of nuclear spins interacting together. So, so this is basically, we call these nuclear magnons, but of course it's not nuclear magnons as they sit on their own. It is electron mediated generation of a collective state, essentially. So it's the, all of a sudden, we started from keeping the electron a bit better, and then now we're in this ensemble, uh, nuclear ensemble that has collective modes that we can access. So you can of course do a, a, a quick trick to see if there is any coherence in this ensemble. So you prepare the nuclear spin uh, ensemble into a given IZ in these experiments, they're actually set around zero or some few small percentage. And of course it's distributed over a few of these uh, possible IZ values. And then you immediately, once you cool, you turn off and then you try to drive a sideband and you see if there's any coherent rotations, and, and, and you do. So, so you do see some coherence. It's modest, but there is some coherence in the system, and that's, uh, that's our first entry to a, a coherent ensemble, uh, you know, verified uh, through Rabi oscillations uh, with the ensemble. All right, so now, of course, uh, the first thing to comment is, this is a bit of a letdown. If you're going to talk about coherent nuclear ensemble, this isn't the Rabi oscillation you want to show. This is a big crap again, right? So why is this so bad? It's because it goes back to the, the nature of these quantum dots. They are highly strained. That's great because strain actually generates the quadrupolar coupling. So they actually talk to each other so that we have these, these side transitions. We have magnons because we have strain. Fantastic. Two, we have strain dispersion. That means from atom to atom, we want them to be identical, but they're not identical. Depending on where they are in the quantum dot among the, the 50,000 nuclear spins, they see a different value of strain. So the strain is dispersed and that's what gives us this, this reduction of the uh, coherent oscillations. So ideally what you want is a system that is strained uniformly. Okay, keep that in mind as a, a, a drop in note. We'll come back to it later. And then the second thing, of course, is even though I showed one, two, three peaks, there are indium, gallium, arsenide, uh, arsenic, and they all have isotopes. So, you know, it's, it's a zoo of different species, actually. So what you're seeing is the collective sum uh, or average of their responses uh, giving us that, that transition. But ideally, this is what's happening, that each one individually is split by different, uh, by different amount. So, and in fact, you can, you can resolve them if you do, uh, if you work back with this information, you can resolve and see where the individual peaks are supposed to show up for indium and for arsenic and all that, yeah. So the, the final part I wanna get to, I'm mindful of time as well. The final part I wanna get to is, let's say that you created the nuclear spins as we have done. Can you actually sense it? Because if this is going to be useful at all, to be able to see either some many body dynamics in this ensemble or maybe even use it as a memory, you need to be able to read out what is there. To be able to read out what is there, it's not, it's, it's okay to generate it, but you need to, in the absence of that, you need to go in there with a measure. What is your tape measure in this case? Your electron was there to create and annihilate them. The tape measure is your electron again. Your electron acts as a sensor if you, if you correctly use it. So your proxy qubit, the one-to-all connectivity uh, of your electron actually becomes now your, your sensor mechanism as well. So I'll highlight this as first the challenge. A single, so let me remind you, a magnon is collectively enhanced. That's why it is so, you know, quote, easy to see it. Detecting a magnon, however, is not the same problem. A magnon, a single magnon in the ground state, a single magnon is has the same size as one nuclear spin, a signal. It's the same signal as a single nuclear spin. A single nuclear spin collectively spread over the whole ensemble is what we're looking at when we talk about a, a, a single magnon. That corresponds to a 200 kilohertz shift of those two energy levels for, a for the electron spin. 
Electron spin is split by 28 gigahertz in our experiments. So we're trying to resolve 200 kilohertz shift of 28 gigahertz electron spin resonance. That's the challenge to be able to notice a single one, not a mode populated by many, but actually down to a single one. So that's the, that's the challenge right there. So what you need to do is make sure that you really stabilize everything else. You do your tricks uh, in terms of uh, you know, best way to measure shifts. And that is by doing side of fringe Ramsey interferometry. Uh, so basically we actually map phase into amplitude and it's the Ramsey, the coherence of the electron that was enhanced by cooling of the nuclei is what measures what's happening to the nuclei, the dynamics of the nuclei. And this is just a figure of merit to show that we're able to reach uh, basically signal tones of four for a signal of 200 mega, uh, kilohertz expected by simply doing these control pulses, uh, pulse sequences. And I think uh, it corresponds to about two parts per million sensitivity. So in a quantum dot, all of a sudden we find ourselves doing effectively precision spectroscopy <laughs> on a solid state system uh, as a requirement to do anything, anything beyond. So uh, just to show you what, what it takes to get to that level of sensitivity, uh, this is our pulse protocol. We prepare the nuclear spins. This is, this is the cooling part I talked about. This is the magnons part, it's only the first one. Then we take a reference signal to see what our baseline is for our, uh, where our nuclear spin is. This is. Effectively, this is an IZ measurement. And then we drive for a while, a coherent drive to the nuclear ensemble. And then we do this, the sense technique again, X, Y, uh, to get the best out of the, uh, uh, in terms of phase. And then we do, again, the same thing. And then we do the opposite, just to be able to see the plus and minus one. Uh, and we can do it either individually or both combined. And then we look at the, the frequency difference of the reference from the sensing, which eliminates any common mode uh, fluctuations and stuff like that. All right, so what do we see? This is, this is what our magnon spectrum looks like when we create uh, magnons. And this is now the Oberhauser shift, the actual shift that corresponds to what you had before, this, this profile versus that profile plus one more magnon, all right? And it mapped as, as Oberhauser shift, this is what you get as your signal. So when you're, when you're causing a nuclear spin flip in the positive sense, you get a positive phase shift because you're increasing the magnetic field seen by the electron by one nuclear spin on the order of 200 kilohertz. So here the correspond, our numbers correspond to around 300 kilohertz. And for different species here, the magnetic field is large enough that we can split indium from arsenic atoms. So you can actually see species modes corresponding to special species uh, reacting to uh, the change. And of course, it's po polar because if the, if the nuclear spin is on the other side, vectorially, it's, it's acting to reduce the overhauser, the, the overall electron splitting. So this is 28 gigahertz minus 300 kilohertz and plus 300 kilohertz as you're seeing uh, in this picture. So we can actually see a single magnon's presence or a single nuclear spin effectively by using this, uh, the, the electron as a sensor. So electron has multiple hats to play uh, in this picture. And then if you now take this differential shift, this Oberhauser shift as a function of how much you're driving, you see the, the coherent oscillations of the magnon as it decays over time uh, in the process. So basically you're, you're seeing it come to life and, and disappear the magnon, the single nuclear spin station come and go as part of this coherent drive uh, sensed by the electron through uh, purely through uh, uh, energy shift that it experiences. All right, so uh, I, I mentioned this part uh, before. I'm, I'm going to wrap up now. We're, uh, I'm, I'm mindful of time as well. So basically I've shown you that by, by trying to make the electron and photons better and better, we've actually improved to, a, to an extent that what caused nuisance until now, uh, particularly the nuclear spins are actually become, they have become resources to study. They're interesting features to study. Um, from that perspective, strain is good, as I mentioned, but the strain dispersion is bad. That didn't give us, this is the reason why we don't have very sharp peaks over here that we would love to have. Instead, these are broader features. So we're just about crossed the line of, of good coherent uh, interactions. And one way to solve the strain dispersion is to actually work with unstrained systems, unlike gallium arsenide, like here, uh, they give us this, the, 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 you know, the, the quadrupolar nature of the nuclear spins, but random distributed, uh, you know, the, the actual value is distributed depending on where you are in the quantum dot. That's the dispersion that we, we don't like to have. 
we'd like to, uh, so this is the distribution that you're seeing over here. There's another type of uh, quantum dot system, gallium arsenide based quantum dot system that we're also pursuing where there is no strain. So basically it's not done through lattice mismatch, it's done through filling a, a bucket, essentially. The atoms go in and fill a bucket with no strain. In the absence of strain, what we need to do then is to apply a global strain, which is easy. You literally squeeze the chip. If you squeeze the chip, you have a uniform lateral uh, strain field you can generate. And then we hope to uh, see much cleaner performance uh, from these dots. So that's, that's as a side uh, future direction to, to follow. But to wrap up, to finish off, I hope I've convinced you that First of all, we have a, a spin ensemble where we can independently tune the IZ value, the mean value from its fluctuations, wherever we park IZ and we're, we're able to go about 30% uh, polarization with uh, controlled uh, uh, reduction of its uh, delta IZ its, uh, fluctuations. And we can access the, access the system coherently. More importantly, we can see individual single ones, single nuclear spin uh, measurement is possible uh, with our system. That allows us to look into two uh, possible directions. One is, can we actually see some dynamics in this many body system? We actually have a many body system. First of all, can we resolve that uh, categorically? Can we say that what we have is a non-classical ensemble of nuclear spins? Can, by cooling, by this mechanism of cooling, are we creating something that is not classical? The answer, which won't, I won't cover here, seems to be yes. So it is actually a quantum correlated ensemble that we're creating as a as the, as the final product of a steady state drive. And that's, I'm giving this um, this archive uh, here as reference for anyone who might be interested in the details of it. But basically it does indeed turn out to be a dark state that we're creating and an ensemble dark state, uh, which is very exciting to, to play with. So it allows us to do many interesting features, including perhaps time crystals, discrete time crystals or things along those lines to study all within a single quantum dot seen by a single electron controlled optically uh, externally. And the other more applied uh, version is perhaps realize a po possibly realize a deterministic quantum memory where you, we benefit from the direct interaction of the nuclear spins, but we don't have one, two, three. We have many, so we get the root and enhancement that you get in on the ensemble picture as well, all together in, in one one. All right, I'll finish off with those two directions that we would like to pursue. And I'll thank the people that actually done the work uh, primarily day in, day out. And this is, uh, these are the names over here. And I, most importantly, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mate. This was a wonderful talk and very clear. So there are actually many questions. So let me start. Um, regarding uh, the cooling, if you want, method of the, of the collective um, um, nuclear spins, uh, what is the ultimate limit and, uh, and then in the context of what is the limit in the cooling process and also in the context of once you start to resolve the sidebands, one, could one think about performing uh, sideband cooling? Yes, so um, effectively we're doing a, a bit of that, right? So the, the, the bottleneck for us ultimately is in, this, in these experiments is the, the, is the strain dispersion. So if we can beat the strain dispersion, then we can actually uh, go, go beyond what we have right now, this is the 400 micro Kelvin or so. Um, and we, we, we can technically be down to a single or two, like one to two nuclear spin fluctuations, but that you cannot beat. At that point, you're already at the, the quantum limit. That's the quantum noise, right? So, uh, so in, in principle, is we're limited by material. Um, fundamental problem, I would say, is diffusion. So ultimately, we have the quantum dot that has 50,000 nuclear spins. The rest of the matrix has billion you know, nuclear spins. Uh, what protects, what gives us a chance to do any of this is the fact that unlike some other systems, our quantum dots being strained, the nuclear spins are kind of uh, 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 decoupled from the environment matrix, the, the matrix nuclear spins by their Zeeman splittings. The strain changes, the, di uh, the quadrupolar nature changes the ones inside the quantum dot with respect to the ones outside. So they're kind of protected, but ultimately there's a limit to it. And that's our baseline diffusion that we have out of the quantum. Dot. So that would be the limitations. But fundamentally nothing stops us actually to reach a few spin uncertainties. Uh, just for reference, the 40 micro Kelvin get, gets us to around a bit less than 10 states. So when we park an IZ, we're around plus minus five on both sides. Mm -hmm. And uh, recent experiments, which again, I haven't talked about what we're working on right now, Apart from the oven is we're around three, four. So we can actually reduce uh, down to single digit uh, company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Good. Uh, there is another uh, question in the context of cooling. So uh, in order to reduce the entropy of the nuclear spins, could one think about using the electron spin to make a very strong measurement of the of IZ and in that way project the nuclear spins into a lower entropy state? We do that. I mean, this is exactly what we do. In fact, the uh, uh, IZ is very, very well measured. The problem is, mm -hmm. you know, there, there are other eyes around, right? So mm -hmm. <laughs> IZ alone is not enough. So what ideally we would love to do is full tomography on the nuclear spins, but we don't have the drive, the microwave or radio wave drive to tilt the axes to make a measurement. We're, we're unable to do the full map, but uh, we can infer there, there's, a, there's an entanglement witness that is possible to, to determine uh, exactly what kind of a state you have. It's more of an inference rather than a full-on tomography, but we are making a very clear IZ. The problem is you have many species. So for a given IZ, do you get equal polarization for indium and arsenic or do you get more arsenic and less indium. The, all of those are degeneracies that we have to deal with at this present uh, mm -hmm. circumstances. Mm -hmm. But great question. Yeah, yeah. and uh, there are also a couple of questions regarding the first part. Uh, if you don't mind, maybe we ask them too. Uh, Please, maybe yeah. from a brother, uh, from, from the first part, from the introduction. Um, what determines the splitting between the X1 minus, X2 minus, and so on? Is it the charge levels? Is it the size of the dot? It's, uh, it, it's the... the uh, the total energy of the initial state versus the final state. So for example, a neutral exciton, X0, would be the initial state is one electron and one hole trapped inside a quantum dot. So they're Coulomb attracted to each other. There's a binding energy. And then the final state is photon comes out, the charges disappear. So it's an empty quantum dot. The difference is exactly the photon energy. Now, when you look at a charged quantum dot, this is the final state, once the photon is emitted, is a single electron. The initial state before a photon is emitted is two electrons and a hole. The two electrons will repel. The hole will be attracted to both of those. And then there's exchange coupling between them. So when you factor in all these energy terms, you just subtract in, uh, initial from final, you end up with these slight, slight modifications, which are very useful for us to distinguish the transitions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. And uh, uh, what is the state, uh, uh, the state detection efficiency for a quantum dot? Uh, what are we detecting? The electron spin or, or the nuclear spin? Uh, the electron spin. Ah, uh, so we can, basically we can do, uh, one thing we've done is in the past is we've used couple quantum dots so that we had one quantum dot that had the electron that we're interested in, a second quantum dot as the observer nearby so that uh, by simply uh, electric field of the, uh, of the spin uh, of the electron, you could tune uh, the optical transitions of the quantum dot. That, if we have that combination, which we're, we don't have in these measurements, but mm -hmm. if we have that kind of a device, uh, state readout is, was at the time was 97% single shot. So you can actually measure with a very high fidelity, but it's a complicated setup to, to make. So it's not readily available. Uh, in these in this cases, we're not collecting enough photons to do single shot readout, uh, but the readout fidelity is quite high because we can uh, uh, be there, uh, no, sorry, I take it back. Um, if we are able to combine it to a cavity, then we will be able to do a single shot with very high, again, 98% uh, or so. Good. And maybe the last question connecting a bit the conclusions and the interaction. So in the context of now being able to uh, control the nuclear spins in the quantum regime, um, and also in the context of quantum networks or, or coupling long distance uh, quantum dots, would it be possible to think about entangling the nucleus, uh, the ensembles of nuclear spins, similarly to what, for instance, uh, experiments uh, by Eugene Polzik and, and others have done with atomic ensembles? Absolutely. I think uh, the, the, the system is now analogous, albeit uh, perhaps not as clean, uh, but, but it is analogous in, in many uh, respects. So uh, once you, um, we have already created entanglement between two quantum dots, two spins, uh, the, the challenge will be can you keep the coherence long enough to actually transfer it to the nuclear spins, the whole process? Uh, but aside from that, and hopefully with Galmar's night quantum dots, it will be quite possible. But yes, that's exactly the idea. We would like to try to see if they could, in principle, be used as a quantum memory, storage of information and extracting back out. Uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Uh, thank you very much. So I, I'll pass the mic now to, to Christian. Yeah, many thanks, Matt. Again, this was a really great talk. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, 
So, so what 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 remains to be said is uh, we we wish uh, all our viewers uh, a nice summer uh, because now comes the summer break of the quantum science seminar, uh, and we will be back uh, in autumn, possibly with a slightly uh, different schedule. But uh, we are discussing this at the moment, so stay tuned and check out our website. And uh, goodbye. <laughs>